Another Dead Teenager, a Paul Turner Mystery Book 3. Author, Mark Richard Zubro. Stonewall Inn Mysteries. Narrator, Eric Ost. At home, Paul examined every room in the house carefully before allowing anyone inside. He hurried over to Mrs. Telushi's to retrieve Jeff. He told her the news and ran back. Fenwick said, I've got uniformed cops on the way. Is there going to be shooting, Dad? Jeff asked. No, son. We're just being careful. Ben stood quietly in the background. Brian said, Jose was in the article, too. We've got to warn them, Paul said. I can do that, Brian said. No, it should be somebody from the police. We'll stop before we go back to the station. We've got to follow this lead. The boys will be safe here after protection arrives. I can stay the night, Ben offered. Thanks, Paul said. Even with cops nearby, I'd prefer to have somebody they know around. We could stop at Jose Martin's on our way back. I want to go with you, Brian said. It's not necessary. You've never met Jose's dad, Brian said. I can help talk to him with you. I'd like to be there when you tell Jose. He's my friend. If we're in danger... We should send uniforms to cover their house until we get there, Fenwick said. I want you here, son, Paul said. We'd have to make a trip back just to drop you off. Dad, I really think I should be there. Why? Well, be because... Brian hesitated. It'll be fine, Paul said. Dad... Brian began another protest, but shrugged his shoulders and stopped abruptly. He looked confused and upset. Paul could see his son wanted to make more objections. He couldn't figure out what the big deal was about Brian wanting to go. It's nearly midnight, Fenwick said. Should we call ahead? They go to bed early, Brian said. If we're going to wake them out of a sound sleep... We should be there to explain it and not try talking over the phone and then showing up. Let's just go. Uniformed cops in a squad car took up their post outside the house. Brian gave his dad Jose's address after assuring Jeff he would not be able to see gunfire if he stayed awake. They left. They found the tiny bungalow on Hubbard Street, two blocks east of Western Avenue. A post-midnight hush enveloped the well-lit Tree Line Street. They found two cops sitting in a squad car at the curb. Anything? Turner asked them after introductions were over. Couldn't be quieter. What's going on? Connected to the Goldstein murder, Fenwick said. Wow. One of the uniforms said. Anything we can do? We'll try and set up people to watch there all night. Tomorrow we'll figure out a better situation. And they turned from the car and walked up the cement walk. The well-trimmed grass was still green from the recent rains and unseasonable warmth. Turner and Fenwick wore only sports coats in the mid-sixties weather. The embankment for the northwestern train tracks loomed behind the house. No lights were on inside. Turner rang the bell and banged on the front door several times before he saw lights turn on through a curtained window on their left. For a minute, he thought maybe they should have called ahead. The porch light flicked on, and a voice called through the door. Who is it? Uh, Paul Turner. Brian Turner's dad. I'm a police officer. It's important, Mr. Martin. We have to talk to you. And the door opened several inches. Realizing he'd never met Mr. Martin, Turner pulled out his identification and held it up. No light shone in the space immediately behind the man, and the outside bulb only illuminated the bottom half of the doorway. Turner couldn't get a good look at Martin's face. What's this about? Mr. Martin asked. He made no move to open the door any further. We think Jose is in danger, Turner said. We'd like to explain what's wrong. He's here. He's not in danger. Uh, what is it? Well, Turner recognized Jose's voice from deeper in the house. He didn't know any kids who called their parents by their first names, but he ignored the slightly jarring note. He didn't care about their family relationships. He just 
wanted to warn them and get back to Area 10 headquarters. He saw the face he could barely make out turned away. He heard Mr. Martin's muffled voice. Police, I might have to let them in. Go put some clothes on. The face turned back to them. We've got a squad car here already, and we've got backup protection coming, Turner said. We haven't done anything wrong, Mr. Martin said. I know you haven't. We have reason to believe your son is in danger. Can we come in? A timely warning was turning into a hassle. He wondered why. Lights flicked on in the living room and the door slowly eased open. The room they entered was painted white. A 35-inch screen television set in one corner. Individual pieces of a complete set of brown leather covered living room furniture were backed against three walls. A couch, love seat, and two reclining chairs. The rug was off-white and spotless. One wall was devoted to sports trophies on rows of bookshelves. Another had a 20 by 30 inch painting of an autumn scene in a mountain valley. A third had a poster of an athletic looking man's bare chest and jean clad hips. He was holding a baby against his chest. A young father with a, a newborn? On top of the television with an 18 by 24 inch black and white picture of Mr. Martin and his son. Their faces close together and smiling. They had their arms around each other's shoulders. Behind them was a crowd in front of a float from a parade. Turner and Fenwick sat on the chairs. Mr. Martin sat on the couch. He wore gray knit pants and a plain white t-shirt. He hadn't put on shoes or socks. His bushy inch thick mustache seemed an odd contrast to the fur cut hair on his head. On his upper arm he had a tattoo that was half covered by the t-shirt. Turner couldn't make out what it was. Wearing jeans, white socks, and a baggy sweatshirt, Jose entered the room and sat next to his dad. He greeted Turner courteously. Turner immediately noticed that while Jose's skin was dusty gold, his dad's was bright pink. Uh, the father's frame was bulky but not fat, and gave no hint of the lean strength of the son. Turner wondered about the difference. But both father and son were looking at him with puzzled expressions, waiting for an explanation of this late-night intrusion. Turner noted that Mr. Martin's right hand held the left rigidly. He did not wear a wedding ring. Turner explained about the case and the possibility of there being danger for Jose. We don't want trouble, Mr. Martin said when he finished. Uh, we think we should leave some uniformed officers outside for tonight. And then they could set up a detail at the school tomorrow. Turner said, We can figure out what to do on a more regular basis after that. How long is this going to last? Martin asked. As long as it takes to catch the killer, Fenwick said. We don't want to bother the police, Martin said. It's not a bother, and the danger is real, Turner said. I don't know, Martin said. Didn't sound like you really had a lot of information to go on. Aren't you overreacting a little bit? Martin's voice was gruff and unyielding. Turner wondered what the problem was. Not if there's a possibility my son is in danger, Turner said. Well, Dad, Jose said, it'll be okay. They'll catch the guy and everything will be fine. Martin looked doubtful. I can protect my kid myself. Eventually, you'll have to go to work, Fenwick said. The cops can't protect him forever, either, Martin countered. You'll be lucky to get much support now. You can't stay for days, weeks, and months. We can get protection for the immediate problem, Turner said. We might be able to get some of the task force people to freed up. The only permanent solution is catching the killer. Until then, we'll think of something. I don't know, Martin said. Dad... Jose said, it'll be fine. The cops won't need to come in the house, Martin asked. No, Turner said. Okay, I guess. A few minutes of discussion of logistics followed, then the detectives left. That was odd, Fenwick said in the car. You mean odd funny or odd illegal? I'm not sure. Something didn't sit right. It was strange, all right, although, think about it. You get woken up out of a sound sleep, and given the news that your kid is in danger, they can throw you, Turner said. I suppose. They hope the first father and son not to look much alike, Fenwick said. 
didn't look like at all, Turner said. Maybe he's adopted. Possible. And where's the mother? I'll have to ask Brian. I don't know these people. I kind of like Jose, but... I'm sure I've never seen his dad at any of their games. That burr-cut head is noticeable on top of that bushy mustache. I don't like kids who call their parents by their first names, Fenwick said. It always sounds wrong to me when I hear it. I guess I'm old-fashioned. The tattoo was closer to you. What was it? Couldn't tell. You know that picture on the television was odd, too. I'm not sure why. Oh, no. I don't know. I've got to think about it. They probably took a photo and had it blown up, Fenwick said. Yeah, but there was something about it. Turner shrugged. By 1 a.m., they were on the fourth floor of Area 10 headquarters, with half the crew from their task force still working. They poured over cases involving fatal accidents, suicides, or murders. That had any connection to kids who played sports and had had articles written about them. It was late now for getting much information, but they could talk to police departments in the larger cities. Coroners and medical examiners would have to wait until the morning. We got the background on that football player, Waverly, Fenwick asked. Blessing. Yeah, he was in Seattle in 1985 in college when the killing in Spokane occurred. Close enough, Fenwick said. And in 1991, for the Odessa, Texas killing, he was trying to make it onto a pro team. Practicing in New England somewhere. Not close, Turner said. I want more information on him, Fenwick said. Anything you can find. Around two, Fenwick asked, Are we going to start calling the families of these more likely cases? I'm not sure for what, Turner said. More data? Facts missing from these reports. If these were murders and not accidents, they were never asked all the questions we need answered. I'm not sure I'd want to open up some of these old wounds over the phone. We wouldn't be able to prove we're cops. I'd rather do it in person with valid identification and maybe a local cop or two to smooth the way. We aren't going to be able to travel around the country on the strength of the evidence we've got so far. We better wait on calls to the families, Turner said. If it becomes necessary, we can do it when we call the local papers. Today, we should get more information. I better make sure the callers know what questions to ask. Yeah, I've got a list of instructions for what I want them to find out. Blessing came over to them. I've got to get some sleep, he said. We've got another box of articles to go through from the library, Turner said. We're going to stick with it. I want to start making calls as soon as we can in the morning. We've been concentrating west of the Mississippi because of what we've got so far. Oh, we've got some in the east, Blessing said. Not as many, Fenwick said. Blessing shook his head. I got to sleep. I'll be back by ten. A Turner and Fenwick poured over the copies of articles in the last box for another hour. This better be all of it, Fenwick said. Should be. We've got the accident, suicide, or murder reports on every kid that an article appeared on in seven major papers since 1985. I hope by noon. We're going to have all of the data on the computers and we'll have new stuff from more phone calls. You were lucky. Yeah, Brian's in danger and I'm going to solve this. We're working out, Fenwick assured him. Too exhausted to keep their eyes open, they left a little after three. Paul crawled into bed next to Ben and immediately dropped off to sleep. He awoke at seven. After a shower, he arrived downstairs to find Ben fixing bacon and eggs at the stove, and Jeff with his nose and a book at the kitchen table. He heard Brian's footsteps upstairs, hurrying from bathroom to bedroom as he finished dressing. Are you ever going to get some sleep, Dad? Jeff asked. I got a few hours last night. Maybe later this week. I hope. Paul hugged Jeff and then Ben. Brian thudded downstairs and hurried into the kitchen. What's going on, Dad? He asked. Uh, what happened at Jose's? He pulled a pineapple and a cantaloupe out of the refrigerator. He grabbed a knife from the dish drainer in the sink, sat at the kitchen table, and began cutting into the fruit. 
Paul took some newspapers off the chair near the back door and put them under where Brian was cutting. You feeling okay? Paul asked. I'm fine. A little sore, maybe. It's nothing. Paul told Brian about meeting Jose and his dad. So, everything went okay? Brian asked after Paul finished. Yeah, shouldn't it have? Paul asked. Sure, Brian said. Is it okay for Jose to come over and study tonight? Uh, we've got a big final on Great Expectations. Tomorrow we want to go over our notes. You actually read the book? Both of us did. Jose really liked it. He says he's going to be an English major in college. Good for him. Yeah. He can come over and study, Paul said. We've got security for both of you, said. You've met Jose's dad, right? Mm, yeah. Brian managed to imbue this monosyllable with more teenage annoyance than Paul had heard from his son in two years. Is there a problem? Paul asked. No. Extremely weary and as alert as he could be on less than four hours sleep, Paul asked questions carefully. His, his dad struck me as kind of gruff and unpleasant, he said. I don't think he likes people. Well, the guys don't go to Jose's house much. I've only been a few times. Mostly we stay in the rec room in the basement. We try not to bother his dad. Jose seemed to like him. They get along great. Jose calls his dad by his first name. Yeah, I guess he does. Either you know or you don't, Paul said. Yeah, I've heard him call his dad by his first name. Why are you questioning me? You're handier than Jose or his dad. Am I missing something? All my cop instincts tell me something's not right here. Are you hiding something? I'm not lying about anything. Not lying is one thing. Holding back information is another. What's wrong between Jose and his dad? Nothing. They get along fine. I didn't see his mother last night. Oh. Not... Oh, do you know anything about his mother? She hasn't been around for years. Jose never sees her. Jose doesn't look much like his dad. Do you know if he's adopted? He's not adopted. Paul tried to catch his son's gaze, but Brian concentrated on peeling and chopping and not looking directly at his dad. I've never noticed Mr. Martin at a game, Paul said. Maybe he's shy or he doesn't like football. When his son is the star quarterback and had his picture on the front page of the sports section of the Chicago Tribune, you'd think he'd crow about it a bit. I did. I don't know why he acts the way he does. Maybe you should ask him. Maybe I will. Heavy amounts of teenage exasperation had been creeping into Brian's tone. I don't know what's going on, okay? I don't know anything about the two of them. Or... Brian stopped. The two of them were what? Brian finished slicing the pineapple and cantaloupe, threw out the dregs, took out dishes, and placed servings for four on the table. Ben silently served the eggs and bacon. The four of them began to eat. The two of them were what? Paul reiterated. Brian stretched his broad shoulders and twisted his head as far as he could left and right. He stood up, got himself a glass, opened the refrigerator, and poured himself cold bottled water. He guzzled it for several seconds. Look, Brian, Paul said, you guys are in danger and I need to know as much as possible. Even the smallest thing could be important. A dangerous killer could be after you. It has nothing to do with the killings or any danger. So there is something, Brian sat back down. I hate when you question me like you're a cop. You only hate it when you've done something wrong. Have you done something wrong? No. Then neither has Jose or his dad. And then why won't you tell me about it? You wouldn't understand. Paul stopped himself from slamming his fork down on the table. Paul and Brian were closer than most fathers and sons. Paul had always attributed it to that fact that he told Brian about his sexual orientation when the boy was eight years old. He didn't think Brian understood it completely then, but he was glad he had told him at that age. Early on, he'd been able to resolve questions and confusions about a father who was different. Plus, he'd always tried reason with his son, rather than angry commands for resolving difficulties. 
Paul was exhausted from the lack of sleep and the long days he'd been putting in. He didn't know if he had the patience left to dredge up a reasonable response to his son's comment. He shut his eyes, rubbed his fingers against his eyelids, then placed his hands flat on the tabletop and looked at Brian, whose fists were clenched. Brian shook his head back and forth and refused to raise his eyes to meet his father's. Ben reached across the table and placed his hand gently on Paul's forearm. Paul glanced at the concern in his lover's eyes. He drew a deep breath. And Paul said, I've always been honest with you, Brian. You've always been honest with me. When haven't I tried to understand? You know I always listen. It really hurts that you would say that to me. That really bothers me. Do you actually think there is something you would tell me that I wouldn't try to understand? Do you want me to leave? Ben asked. Without removing his gaze from Brian's downturned face, Paul said softly. It's all right. Please stay. And Jeff stared at the adults and his older brother. Paul saw moisture gathering in his eyes. Paul couldn't remember this kind of all-out fight with his teenage son. Jeff whispered. Please don't fight. Paul placed a hand on his younger son's arm. Everything's going to be all right, he murmured. He looked at Brian, who was staring at his younger brother. Brian hung his head for a minute. He didn't look up as he began to speak. I'm sorry, Dad. I didn't mean... It's just your cop, and... Ah, nuts! Brian picked up his fork and began fiddling with it. I'm really sorry about what I said. I, I know I can trust you more than any guy I know can trust his dad. I, I was frustrated. Brian finally raised his eyes and looked at his dad. I'm really sorry. Honest. Paul put his arm on Brian's shoulder and squeezed gently. It's okay, he said. I'm real tired. Maybe I'm pushing too hard, but I'm concerned about you. I understand, Brian said. They aren't doing something illegal like drugs. No, Dad, none of the guys I hang out with would do that stuff. One of the guys at the party, I made one of them leave because he brought drugs. Good, Paul didn't mention he'd guessed as much. You don't want to know who? If you want to tell me, and it's important. No, it's okay, Paul said. We're losing the main topic here, which is Jose and his dad. Brian set the fork down. I promised I'd never tell. It doesn't have anything to do with any killing. He just said that if it was important about the kid at the party, it was my choice on telling you. If we're going to trust each other, it's got to be about things we do tell and the stuff we don't. Paul held his elder son's gaze. I have a killer to catch. I have you to protect. You're asking me to accept your judgment? You have in the past. I don't know if anything has been as dangerous as this. Depends on how much of an adult you think I am. You've talked to me like an equal for a long time. I like our relationship, especially when I see a lot of the other guys having fights with their parents. I don't ever want to fight with you. I, I don't want to keep secrets from you. This is not my secret to tell. Dad, ask Jose or Mr. Martin, okay? Say the things you said to me to them. Honest, Dad. The secret can't have anything to do with the murders. But ask Jose. Ask Mr. Martin. Please. Dad, not me. If the secret did have something to do with the killing, then Paul missed it because he trusted his boy. He'd have to justify that to his conscience for a long time, especially if any harm came of it to his own son. He'll be here tonight. You can ask him then. Paul agreed reluctantly. You going to warn him I'm going to talk to him tonight? Paul asked. Not if you don't want me to. Don't, Paul said. Please. His son agreed. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, 
and then it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.